Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. We're delighted to have you here for uh, another CIS foray into the issue of, of digital trade, digital trade regulation, particularly with, um, with Europe. Um, commercial first, uh, CSIS has done, uh, spent a lot of time on this subject over the last several years. We've issued, uh, the Scholl Chair alone has issued 10 papers, has had a number of, of events. The most recent event was last week when we looked specifically <laughs> at the Digital Marketing Act with a, uh, in Europe with a panel of, of experts from both Europe and the United States. Uh, this one is, is kind of capping off the, the project uh, with a very distinguished guest. And we're going to uh, descend from, uh, ascend, I think, from the specifics of specific legislation and go to uh, probably 20,000 meters <clears throat> and ask our, our guest to talk about uh, the overall issue of US-EU trade re relations in the digital space. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a, a big area, uh, an area of a lot of activity. And one of the issues that I'm sure he'll comment on, and if he doesn't, I'll ask him, uh, is about uh, a Reuters report earlier this week about a US government document sent to the EU that warns them about the risks imposed by some of their proposals to uh, trade secrets, protection of trade secrets, and, and also cloud services. So we'll, want, we'll be very interested to hear what Peter has to say about uh, how the US government and the uh, European Commission, or the member states for that matter, are interacting on these issues and how he sees this whole thing unfolding. Uh, and if he wants to talk about what uh, the Congress might be doing, um, I wish him good luck with that, but uh, we'll uh, provide that opportunity as well because uh, this is an area where I think um, the United States has, has not moved with the same speed that Europe has to uh, address regulatory issues that are inherent in the technology. And uh, in a way we are uh, kind of uh, inevitably playing defense because we've got nothing to counter uh, their proposals with and whether and if we don't like them, you know, as I've said before, the, you know, the basic rule of politics is you can't beat something with nothing. And hopefully Peter will tell us that we got something, which would be also good to hear. Anyway, our guest, I think most of you in the group know him, <clears throat> because we've had him on before, uh, is Peter Harrell, who is a Senior Director for International Economics and Competitiveness on the White House National Security Council. He's spoken on this issue uh, on numerous occasions in the past, and uh, I think we're very delighted to have him with us. Uh, the format is going to be that Peter is going to make some comments, uh, and then when he's finished, Meredith Broadbent, our uh, non-resident senior fellow and I, are going to have a conversation with him. Uh, and then we will go to questions from, uh, from all of you that are watching. Uh, and you can send us your questions via the Q&A function, uh, or you can put your questions into chat. Uh, either way, uh, I'll do my best to find them and uh, we'll save some time at the end if, uh, if we have questions from you all and if Peter's willing to uh, respond to them. So with that, um, let me turn it over to Peter for opening comments. Well, Bill, let me first begin by thanking you for hosting me today and thanking uh, you and CSIS for your work on uh, a whole range of trade and economic issues, very much including important um, digital uh, related, uh, related issues. I'm going to keep my opening remarks quite short because I really look forward to hearing from the discussion and also, frankly, to hearing from many of the participants today not only on questions, um, but your perspectives uh, on uh, issues of digital uh, regulation in Europe and um, here in the in the United States. So, so I'm, I'm just gonna, again, keep my, my opening remarks um, quite short, but to talk a little bit about how we, uh, as the Biden-Harris administration are seeing and engaging on uh, a number of European uh, regulatory proposals that have the potential to impact uh, tech firms uh, in the United States as well as around the world, particularly the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, which are going through 
uh, as you know, a very complex European uh, process for, um, for enactment. Uh, and I should say, I've, I've learned a lot more about European process over the last couple of months than I, I knew before. And I thought I knew a fair amount about it previously. Uh, so, you know, but still clearly some learning curve to come on how uh, the process of all of this, uh, all of this works. And the first thing I would begin you know, first thing I want to say is, is is actually coming at this from a domestic perspective. I think President Biden has been, you know, quite clear that we think as an administration uh, there are important and legitimate regulatory objectives vis-a-vis -vis, uh, technology firms. You know, the president and his appointees at the FTC and nominee uh, over at the uh, Department of uh, of Justice, as well as appointees here at the White House. But, but again, including the president himself, have been very clear that they think we have enormous problems around misinformation, disinformation, other harmful content online. Uh, they've been quite clear that uh, they think there is uh, excessive concentration of corporate power uh, in a variety of industries, not just the tech industry. I think you saw that with the president's competition uh, EO that came out uh, over the summer and the work uh, that is being carried forward across uh, a variety of um, a variety of, uh, of of different economic sectors coming out of the competition uh, EO, and then obviously you see on a bipartisan basis here in the United States in our Congress a variety of proposals uh, to regulate uh, technology platforms to um, uh, increase kind of competition antitrust uh, enforcement around. Uh, technology platforms. And again, similar to our approach here at the White House to think about increasing competition, antitrust uh, enforcement generally, not limited uh, to the uh, technology sector. So, so I, I just want to say right uh, off the top, we do think there are important and legitimate regulatory objectives uh, when it comes to uh, technology, uh, technology platforms and are, you know, working actively uh, as an administration and uh, with our Congress uh, to um, identify appropriate ways to have smart, tough, sensible uh, regulation that will ensure a competitive uh, online uh, ecosystem, as well as competition throughout our economy, of which the technology sector is obviously an ever-growing share that touches all other uh, sectors uh, of, the, uh, of the economy. So, so that said, I think it actually has given us an interesting an important sort of the fact we are thinking about these issues domestically has given us an interesting and important opportunity to engage with other governments, particularly in Europe, but not limited uh, to governments in Europe around what appropriate and inappropriate ways to regulate the tech sector uh, are. And I think you've seen uh, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo talk about this as she has been speaking publicly about the DMA and the DSA, well, we um, share in many ways some of the, the, the objectives of the DMA and the DSA. Uh, we do have concerns that a number of provisions of the DMA and DSA, uh, if not amended, um, you know, could potentially increase um, uh, cybersecurity vulnerabilities, could uh, potentially result in companies being compelled to uh, share confidential uh, IP beyond what would be strictly necessary to ensure certain interoperability between uh, between services. We do think it's important to have regulatory clarity in definitions, and particularly where there is. Um, you know, a, a, a potential for quite broad new regulations. We also think it's important to ensure that there are mechanisms in place for good and constructive dialogue, both between governments uh, and also between governments engaged in regulation and uh, the regulated uh, sectors. So we think there are important things that can be done to ensure that, you know, scope for, for, uh, for dialogue uh, exists. And then, you know, a, a host of other um, you know, sort of specific uh, changes that we we hope the uh, Europeans um, will make as they 
uh, take forward a regulatory uh, agenda on um, technology companies and on uh, technology uh, platforms. You know, we are from an American perspective, you know, I think we as Americans like to be pretty transparent. You know, we're not really good at hide the ball uh, kind of uh, policy. At least that's been my experience in my years across a couple of administrations uh, now. And so, um, you know, we are in the process of engaging with the uh, European Commission, with uh, members of the European uh, Parliament, uh, with individual European uh, member states. Um, in a kind of provision by provision uh, approach to the um, uh, to both the DMA and the DSA to highlight, you know, where we think there are provisions that um, you know would have uh, unintended consequences around cybersecurity that potentially could you know result, as I say, in in, in um, IP uh, related uh, related issues. Um, and really going through that. Now, I think in Europe, again, to my point on process, obviously these are moving, uh, these are moving documents. Um, there are also you know, new ideas coming up in the European Parliament and elsewhere. So even while we are kind of in the process of sharing our views, we're obviously also watching and monitoring uh, the views that you know, others uh, in Europe and elsewhere are, um, are, uh, are putting on the table. And so I think this is going to be an area where you're going to see you know, quite a bit of uh, regular uh, engagement between the U.S. government uh, and our European uh, partners, friends, and allies uh, over the, the the next couple of months as they take their uh, process uh, forward. So I think I'll, I'll leave it um, there for opening remarks. Really look forward to hearing from all of you. And uh, Bill, you and your colleagues have obviously been doing you know quite a bit of work on this and have uh, had a couple of other. Um, uh, events with outside experts on this, and so would welcome uh, also hearing from you, as I'm sure would members of your audience, and some of the findings you all have uh, have found as you've been looking uh, at these uh, legislative uh, regulatory proposals. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. That uh, gets us off to a good start and is right on point with what I hope we were going to talk about. I can't resist saying that I think you're right with it. We're not very good at hiding the ball. I have to say, in some respects, we are pretty good at kicking the can which is you know, a different game, but I've had that disagreement with Ambassador Tai the last time that she spoke at CSIS. So uh, <clears throat> hopefully this is a case where there will be some outcomes. And that's where I wanna begin kind of at the, the, the 20,000 meter level. And, and then uh, I think Meredith will, will get a little bit more into specifics. Um, I think other people have characterized uh, kind of a fundamental difference of approach between the US and, and the EU uh, to regulation, not just in this sector, but in, in many sectors, that the Europeans favor an ex ante approach and the United States tends to favor an ex post approach. Uh, and uh, we see it, uh, it began in, in agriculture, but what you know, we, we've seen with uh, the digital acts is really an effort to put, build the precautionary principle uh, into, uh, into regulation a number of fronts. I guess I want to begin by asking you, do you think that's a fair characterization of the, of the difference, differences? Uh, and if that's so, if there really is this difference in point of view, is it really going to be possible to reach some common, uh, common ground or some common approach? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to opine on that, Bill, because I've actually never, I've sort of never thought about it in quite that framework uh, previously of us uh, preferring uh, an ex post and them preferring uh, an ex uh, ante approach. I, I certainly think we have seen them over, we've seen our, our European friends and allies over the uh, last number of years take a uh, more aggressive approach on regulation. I mean, and I think that there have been lessons to learn from that. I mean, I look, for example, at, at, at GDPR um, and the, the data privacy regime that the Europeans um, implemented. And I think we as an administration, members of Congress, as we think about domestic data privacy uh, issues, I think there are a number of important lessons to be learned there. You know, for example, I, I, I fear, uh, and maybe it's, it's sort of my jaded uh, cynicism, but I fear for, for too many Companies and too many individuals. GDPR just became the sort of you know check the box exercise where you know you see a little thing pop up, manage cookies. We accept all the cookies. The data goes on um, uh, on um, uh, sort of uh, on uh, uh, you know data collection and, and and sale goes on kind of unabated. And so I think there's there's certainly lessons uh, from looking at the GDPR if you want to think about you know tough sensible privacy legislation. 
Um, and, and, you know, I think that, that, uh, that sort of shows the, uh, risk of moving too quickly and too aggressively, because you might find you're not at the end having the intended, you know, the impact you intend. Uh, and meanwhile, you are just sort of raising a certain amount of friction, um, mm-hmm. for, uh, uh, for users uh, and for 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 companies, so so I guess I, I'm not going to answer your question directly, not because I don't want to, but simply because I hadn't thought about it in quite that framework before, uh, and um, uh, you know would actually want to think about it before uh, opining. Well, you were forthright in your opening comments in talking about some the, some of the provisions that have given uh, the U.S. government pause in the Europeans' uh, uh, planning, and I I I. I Take that as sort of an indirect confirmation that you've approached them about that with some specifics. Is that a fair statement? I, I think it is fair uh, to say directly we have approached them with um, with uh, with some specifics about um, you know again again li- we you know line line by line is maybe a little bit more detailed um, with provision section by section um, you know section by section views because we do think it's important they understand you know where we're coming from. Um, you know, we also think as we've looked at it, we, you know, again, as I said at the top, we actually think there are uh, legitimate and important regulatory objectives to be achieved uh, on uh, both digital services uh, providers and on you know, digital uh, markets uh, more broadly. And so, you know, we'd like to see them, uh, if they are and as they move forward, do so in a way that, you know, appropriately serves legitimate regulatory objectives without having unintended consequences and also in a way that is not um, discriminatory against American firms vis-a-vis other firms, you know, firms based elsewhere uh, in the world, whether in Europe uh, or, 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 or elsewhere. What is there, what, is there what, what, what kind of reaction have you gotten from them? Yeah, so I don't want to get into the specifics of, of individual um, discussions that we have no, had. Yeah. You know, as I say, I think this is a uh, you know, a set of discussions we have had and are having with uh, the commission, with um, uh, member states, with members of the European Parliament. And so, as you can imagine, you get different reactions from different uh, from different um, uh, different folks uh, in Europe. But I, I, what I would say is, I think overall, uh, certainly, it's my hope and my impression, Bill, that you know we are engaged in constructive and. Uh, productive negotiations. And, you know, what we have heard is, um, uh, you know, an openness and receptivity uh, to trying to work through, um, you know, where we from the American side think we have, you know, legitimate interests and concerns uh, to see addressed. Well, let me get one more and then I'll turn it over to Meredith for uh, for a little while. Um, now that you're an expert on EU process, and I admire, I admire you for uh, becoming one because it's complicated, uh, who would you say is going to have the last word on this? The Parliament, the Commission, uh, the member states. Uh, what do you? How do you think it's going to play out over there? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, I'd sort of welcome your views and Meredith's views on that. I also think they're important questions of timing. You know, is this something that'll get wrapped up in the spring under the French presidency? Will it, you know, slip to the fall? I think it's hard to know exactly. Uh, what the timing on both the DMA and the DSA will be um, uh, in the end. And obviously, you know, you do have many parts uh, to the uh, European process. I mean, in some ways, not dissimilar to us, right? We have committees in two different legislative bodies and the executive branch and that. I mean, I'm sure our process looks similarly uh, labyrinthine to uh, foreigners trying to understand how our process uh, works. Um, but I, I, I think it is, you know, you, 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 you certainly see many different uh, parts of the European apparatus coming into play now. Um, and I think they're all clearly going to have, um, you know, impact on the, uh, the final, uh, final um, products. I think that's, I think you're probably right about this. It does seem to be one right now where the parliament is uh, engaged and engaged in detail. Uh, I read somewhere that they might be voting on the DSA in particular, um, at least later this month, which is sooner than I expected, but um, we'll see. And it's clear, as you've pointed out, it's, it's clear that I think the French presidency hopes to wrap some of this up during their, their six months in, in 2022. Um, although I gather, regardless, there'll be a period of before it's full implementation. So 
uh, actual functioning at some time down the road. Um, Meredith, let me turn it back, to, uh, turn it over to you for uh, pursue some issues, and then uh, then I'll take over later on. Meredith. Yeah, I, I think you have a, a real challenge in the sense that the DSA and the DMA are fairly far along the legislative road in Europe, but at the same time, I think they're they're so appropriate for uh, a conversation within the the construct of the Trade and Technology Council because you know that's what we're talking about, uh, trying to cooperate and coordinate on some of this regulation. So the internet uh, legal framework doesn't continue to splinter. Um, are there are there areas of domestic policy that we're working on in the U.S. that might allow you to closer collaborate with the Europeans? Is, are there particular areas that you're keyed on that where we're looking at things very similarly in the U.S. and Europe? Well, you know, so so I am I am on the uh, here focusing more on the international side than right. on the domestic side. We do have obviously domestic colleagues who I think are, are thinking quite closely about uh, regulatory issues. And obviously all of us, whether on the international or on the domestic side, are tracking you know, the different um, bills moving uh, through Congress. I, I would be hesitant to opine on you know, what I think Congress will in fact do. Um, but I do think uh, you know, clearly some of the proposals coming through Congress have broad bipartisan support. And I certainly wouldn't, you know, um, I, I certainly think there's, you know, we, 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 from a diplomatic perspective, have to plan on some new domestic uh, regulations, at least as a, as a contingency. And certainly in the discussions we are having with our European friends, we are trying to explain, you know, and again, we can't speak for Congress, but we're trying to explain our views around some of the bills moving through which I think, as I say, does actually open up the door to constructive uh, collaboration with Europe, because the reality is like the worst case outcome, I think, on both sides is sort of, you know, potentially fairly aggressive, but quite different and distinct uh, regulatory schemes on both sides uh, of the uh, of the Atlantic. Right. Yeah. No, and I, I applaud you for that. The And you also had a great I think a, a good win in the uh, the G7 digital trade principles that were agreed to in, in October, uh, where you were able to start out the document with uh, kind of collectively opposing uh, digital protectionism and digital authoritarianism. And I think those are kind of good comment, good themes to keep in mind as you try to review some of this legislation in those light, because I think, you know, in every in every jurisdiction, there's always protectionist tendencies that that give rise when legislate when regulation is being considered, and and I think it's it's important that uh, that we review things with those kind of concerns in mind and with a keen eye. And it sounds like you're doing that. Did you were you much involved in the G7 uh, document, and and can you say anything about the background on that? No, look, I think we were all tremendously uh, pleased by uh, where the G7 um, digital trade uh, document came out. I uh, I won't want to give a lot of credit to our British colleagues as uh, the, obviously still the chair of the G7. We sort of think about the G7 as being uh, over passed on to the Germans as kind of the next uh, chair of the G7, but the British are still very much kind of running it through this year. And then a smooth handoff to the Germans uh, for next year. And so I really do want to give, uh, in addition to a lot of credit to Ambassador Tai and the, the team over at, um, uh, over at USTR from an American perspective, I also want to really thank our, our British colleagues who I think really helped, you know, kind of um, get us all as G7 members aligned around some core principles, as you note at the top, uh, where I think we are all aligned, but too often in these debates, we sort of focus on the things that are dividing us on aspects of the issue rather than what's aligned. So, um, you know, very happy that that was where, so, you know, product of uh, quite a bit of, um, you know, long discussions and very happy with where it landed. Yeah, it looked good. Um, you had mentioned this in your opening comments, and I, I really appreciate your sort of attention to some of the cybersecurity risks that, that might develop, particularly with the Digital Markets Act, where we're sort of 
uh, the Europeans are looking at, you know, mandating up front that all sorts of data has to be transferred to competitors, which uh, seems to be pretty unwieldy in terms of a regulatory process um, and could open up, uh, you know, a lot of intellectual property concerns and cybersecurity concerns if only the five U.S. tech platforms are required to, to make these disclosures and then it's available for, you know, Chinese or Russian companies, et cetera, et cetera. How are you assessing some of the cybersecurity issues and the intellectual, the, the risk to intellectual property protection? Yeah, so, so you know, I, I think cybersecurity issues are, are obviously front of, of mind kind of across the board for the administration, I think for anyone who works on technology issues, right? I mean, you just sort of have to look at the events of the last year, um, last six months, you know, there's a colonial pipeline um, hack or, you know, the breaches of major American companies and, you know, other ransomware attacks. I and mean, I, I, you sort of goes without saying that this set of issues has to be um, front of, uh, front of, front of mind. And so we are, and, you know, we've been, listening to both companies and to outside experts to try to understand, you know, what and where there might be um, cybersecurity vulnerabilities uh, that would be opened up as a result of some of the uh, compelled uh, sharing of data and compelled sort of, um, uh, you know, where, 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 you know, you know, compelled nature where a company that maybe has a relatively closed platform has to open the platform uh, up a bit. You know, we're not, we're, as I said at the beginning, like we're not tell, we're not sort of saying there aren't legitimate regulatory objectives here. We're just sort of uh, saying that there have to be, as you are looking at increasing competition, you know, some of which increasing competition may well require uh, companies to, you know, make their products a little bit more interoperable. I mean, that may be, you know, something that, that, that has to happen to increase competition. But we want to make sure that if that is what's going to happen, it is done so in a way that doesn't, you know, sort of a technically feasible way that doesn't introduce um, cybersecurity vulnerabilities, that lets companies have strong cybersecurity protocols in place, maintain those cybersecurity protocols, and that, you know, minimizes uh, the 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 kinds of information that would have to be uh, shared to you know only things that would be absolutely essential to ensure effective uh, functioning. Right. Okay. Um, in a speech last week, Ambassador Tai said that the standards for privacy must be determined domestically. Um, and it seems to me that we we probably need to look more uh, in coordination with the Europeans on that issue. I mean, we I think deciding domestic privacy standards domestically seems that we're going to be fragmenting the internet a lot more. Um, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, look, I, I think she, I you know I don't want to speak for the ambassador, and I think what she. Um, was probably trying to get at is, you know, we do have an active debate here domestically about what our domestic, you know, about domestic, new domestic privacy uh, protections. And I think that, that we, you know, we, it would be useful for us to get through that debate and to have a much stronger domestic data privacy regime, which we can then go out and, you know, talk some with allies and partners about how to make sure it is, they are harmonized, how to make sure um, you know, as 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 we take steps domestically, that, that, that they are broadly aligned uh, with our with our allies and partners. I don't think that, you know, as as I sort of said, I think we would we as we look at domestic data privacy issues have a lot of important lessons to learn about what has not worked as well as what has worked from other country experiences like GDPR. And so I think it's important for us to be able to learn those lessons, set what is appropriate here, and then cooperate with allies and partners on kind of shared approaches. I think probably what she was trying to get at is we, we we're not gonna sort of take as whole cloth some privacy you know, regime that was developed elsewhere and import it here to the US. Would it help you if Congress did pass privacy legislation? You know, I'm not here to talk about exactly what um, uh, Congress uh, should or shouldn't do. I think we are evaluating various proposals and you know, working through what we, where we stand on a variety of the proposals that are out there. Got it. I'd also um, note there are things, I mean, like you've seen, you know, I think you've seen um, Lena Khan at the FTC talk about uh, privacy. Obviously, one of the president's 
uh, nominees, uh, Alvaro uh, Bedoya to the FTC is a very well-known privacy um, uh, activist uh, and scholar uh, coming out of uh, legal academia. So I, I, I do think, you know, we are, uh, as an administration, we care quite a bit about data privacy and we are, um, you know, looking at various ways to increase protection of data privacy domestically. I'd also note, and you saw this in the commerce, um, in the, you know, I think you also saw in the uh, Commerce Executive Order, or the President's Executive Order back in May, directing the Commerce Department to set up a new process to look at the data security uh, and data privacy risks posed by the operation of Chinese and Russian apps and software here in the US, right? And the Commerce Department is now setting up a whole um, potential uh, regime to review the data privacy and data security risks uh, posed by Chinese and Russian um, uh, companies uh, and app, apps and software here in the US. And you're gonna see us carrying that forward pursuant uh, to that EO. I think there was also a provision in that EO that got uh, specifically at some of the um, risks we see around bulk data sales, uh, where we see both kind of privacy risks and also potential national security risks where you know a foreign competitor can purchase bulk data and de-anonymize it uh, in ways that can be quite troubling. So I think we are from an administration perspective kind of looking across the suite of options we have um, both in the executive branch and with Congress to ensure that Americans' data is you know, private and secure as Americans would like it to be. Got it. Um, Ambassador Tai's speech also was pretty light on market access objectives for USTR in this sector. Um, and I, I think it's important to sort of think about these five companies being the targets of European regulation and sort of looking at, you know, domestically, what are they contributing in terms of sort of uh, skilled uh, middle level jobs that has been actually pretty robust job creation recently, much higher than in the health sector and so forth. Are you all thinking of a worker centric trade policy as something that would help these companies continue to, to create jobs in the US and maintain their market access in Europe at the same time? Look, we are um, very, you know, as you, as you hear Catherine talk about in every, pretty much every major speech um, she gives, and as well as just, you know, remarks that are not major speeches, we are as an administration extremely focused on, as you, as you say, Meredith, quoting Catherine, a worker-centered trade policy, and particularly thinking about how kind of trade policy both potentially benefits and impacts, you know, middle income uh, Americans. And that's sort of a distinct priority uh, for us. And so, you know, we certainly see um, opportunity for jobs, including middle income uh, American jobs in the, in the, 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 the digital space. Um, but I think as you've seen her say, she's also very focused on, you know, manufacturing, on agriculture, on a number of other uh, sectors as we think about, you know, overall, um, uh, overall uh, trade, uh, trade policy. Are we seeing Are we concerns um, with respect to the Digital Market Act and the Digital Services Act in Europe of sort of stifling what's been very robust job creation there in the startup sector? I mean, Europe seems to think that if they rein in U.S. companies and hamper the access of U.S. companies that you know, more companies will grow up in, in Europe. I mean, are we, are we buying that? Are we concerned that some of this heavy handed regulation may actually squelch some of the job creation that has been occurring in Europe in the startup sector? Well, look, I hope you're asking that question of the commission and of uh, European member states, right? I do think, you know, we have seen here such a tremendous, you know, job growth from the success of our digital sector, you know, first and foremost here at home, and then obviously um, internationally. And I do think, you know, kind of back to the point I made at the beginning, like, I think when you're doing aggressive regulation, there is are important, you know, we support domestically, um, uh, you, you know, uh, competition, strong competition enforcement and things like that. But I think as you are looking at new regulations, you always have to be thoughtful and careful and analyzing, you know, what is this going to do to economic activity? What is this going to do to job uh, creation? And so, you know, look, I would I would encourage, you know, folks who've done analysis uh, on uh, that set of issues, you know, if, if these 
provisions in DMA and DSA are actually going to hinder you know job growth in Europe. I'd encourage you to share that with the with the Europeans. I mean, we're sort of looking at this more from an American perspective, right? And sort of what it's doing in Europe, right? I mean, that's sort of in, in some sense their issue, right? And, and, and not not ours. But uh, I'd certainly you know it's something that I would I would I would think if I were a European policymaker, I'd be thinking about. Got it. Um, one more question on sort of the digital trade agenda. Um, do you think the administration will be able to, to push for a more affirmative digital trade agenda in Asia with our allies or with the UK or with the Indo-Pacific area? We've seen you know, argue, uh, articles in the press that you're maybe thinking about this and wondered if there was anything you could say yet. Well, look, I think you have, you know, Secretary uh, um, Raimondo and Ambassador Tai, you know, going to consult and listen closely to a number of our Asian allies and partners about what they are, uh, what they are interested in. And certainly from an administration perspective, we think it is important to have a robust, uh, forward-leaning um, uh, economic engagement uh, agenda in the Indo-Pacific, both for our economic interests. There's a ton of economic opportunity out there. Uh, and also geopolitically and geostrategically, right, where we are in an era of, of, of competition with China and we need to be, you know, forward leaning and get our get be, be present in the region, not just in a defense uh, context, but also in an economic um, context. I think as you've, as you've seen, you know, we're interested in talking with our allies and partners about, you know, a whole range of topics, right, including you know, investment relationships and investment screening, you know, including supply chains and how do we kind of talk with allies and partners about, you know, friend shoring our supply chains, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, other economic issues of which I think, you know, digital is, 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 is one of them and of interest to a number of our uh, friends and partners in the region. But I think as you've seen Catherine as, and as you've seen Gina, you know, talk about this. We are interested in hearing and talking with our allies about kind of a range of different uh, economic issues. Um, you know, including digital, but by no means uh, limited uh, to uh, to digital. Yeah, I noticed the Chinese are are requesting to also join a couple of the digital agreements out in the Asia Pacific, um, and it would be, I think, difficult for them to get in and not us. So, um, it, I think it's important for us to have a presence there in some of these agreements. Bill, do you want to take it from here, or should would you want to do some of the yeah, well? We've got audience uh, questions. Yeah, we've got a, a a few audience questions that arrived, and let me remind the audience that if you have questions, now is the time to put them in the Q and A uh, function. Uh, but I I want to come back to um, uh, a couple other matters, and then we'll get to the get to the audience. Um, first, <clears throat> one of the we've talked about privacy. You've talked about the DMA and the DSA. One area that uh, we haven't talked about yet is artificial intelligence and uh, AI. <clears throat> um, is this also an area where we're having a dialogue with uh, the Europeans? They've also made a regulatory approach in AI. Is uh, is this one that has, where you've, do you have the same level of concern with that proposal that you have with the others? And are we having a dialogue with them about, about AI? So we most certainly are talking to the Europeans about AI. I think you saw that reflected in the um, September outcome statement from the Trade and Technology uh, Council, where you saw a specific focus on um, AI and on work to try to come to some joint, you know, agreement on some important principles around AI. And you also saw uh, a, a commitment to doing a kind of joint report on the jobs and economic uh, impacts of, uh, of AI. I do think this is an area where there is potential for quite a bit of cooperation. I mean, I think you see, for example, strong appetite, and you saw this reflected in the TTC outcome, strong appetite on both sides to ensure we don't end up in some kind of you know, dystopian world where AI is using to give is being used to give us all social credit scores, then you know, impede our ability to live our uh, live our lives. I think we do need to get a better handle around, you know, what are the potential over the next sort of over the midterm, you know, jobs impacts uh, of uh, AI on on both uh, both sides to prepare for changes. Now, obviously, like 
The workforce has always adapted through major technological disruptions, but I think there is a case to be made. We're about to see another major techno technological disruption. We need to make sure we are positioning our workforce to adapt itself, uh, itself through that. And so we need to better understand what the what the potential um, uh, what the potential uh, impacts uh, are. There's also just a practical reality that we need to work with the Europeans on, which is that you know, frankly, there's a little bit of tension between our um, desire to increase data privacy. Uh, and our ambitions to maintain a lead in AI. And I, I don't want to overstate that, but you know, the, one of the ways you get effective AI is by having very large data sets to train your, your algorithms and your, 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 your products against. And if you have a you know, very, um, you know, if you, if you have data privacy laws that make it very hard to build those AI uh, build those large data sets you can use for effective AI. That is that is something you have to kind of think through. And that's why we sort of, I think you saw in the TTC outcomes, you only want to work with Europe some sort of what are the ways we can, you know, develop some shared approaches to privacy protecting AI development and things like that. Because I, we, we want to make sure that, that, you know, we want to make sure we remain the world's leader in AI. We want to make sure that we understand and get out ahead of the potential disruptions that AI might have. And we also want to understand that as we how as we work to quite a you know have with allies and partners quite strong data protection, data privacy protections, you know, if we do, we want to make sure we don't sort of inadvertently undercut um, the development of AI here and seed the field uh, to competitors. So it's, it's actually, yes, we very much are working on this set of issues uh, with, the, uh, with the Europeans as well. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the, the TTC because I wanted to, uh, before we get to the audience, I just wanted to ask you, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on a process issue. Is, is, the, is the Trade and Technology Council going to, going to be the venue for addressing all these issues or do you address them uh, separately in, in other ways, or are, are we should we be looking at the various working groups, not just on AI, but on other digital trade issues as well, or should we be looking somewhere else? So, so the TTC is definitely a uh, important venue to foster cooperation, whether it's on AI, whether it's on you know algorithmic regulation, whether it's on um, you know, uh, talking through the DMA and DSA, you know, back to sort of our point on our discussion earlier, Bill and Meredith on, on process, you know, clearly, well, the TTC is a very important venue and sort of, I think, a, a kind of a um, primary venue for many of these uh, issues in our engagement with the European Commission. Um, obviously, where some of these issues you know, like today we're seeing with DMA and DSA also are going through member states and European Parliament. We obviously also want to be discussing, you know, the same views we are sharing through the TTC to share with the Commission, with member states, and with you know relevant other uh, actors uh, actors in 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 Europe. Just given the way their system uh, works. Let me turn uh, to um, some audience questions now because we've gotten a number of them and. One of them is just kind of a follow-up, uh, a specific follow-up to what you just said, uh, which is how is progress coming on restoring transatlantic trusted data flows? Are we getting close to a long-term solution uh, overcoming adverse EU court rulings? Um, so we have, um, you know, uh, we, we have been, as you've seen publicly, we have been in uh, negotiations for a number of months now. I mean, they, they uh, sort of began um, at the sort of tail end of the previous administration and then really picked up uh, back, in the, back in the spring as we settled in to negotiate a successor to the uh, US-EU Privacy Shield um, Adequacy Agreement. And we have um, been engaging in very robust, very constructive uh, negotiations with the uh, with the commissioner uh, commission on that at different levels, both at a technical level and at a uh, at a cabinet level, and you know all I will say on that is we you know we have found these negotiations to be constructive. It's a it's a thorny issue of sort of reconciling 
different legal systems on both sides, right? They have court rulings they are uh, dealing with. We have legal and constitutional as well as policy constraints on our side. And so you've got to kind of be constructive and creative in terms of how do you, you know, how do you mesh together these um, fairly different uh, structures we have on both sides? But they've certainly been, you know, very constructive uh, negotiations. And, and out of respect for the privacy of the specifics, I'm not going to get into the specifics of where we are, but other than to say they've been constructive and positive. Okay, the next question is a long one, but I think it's an interesting one. So I'm just going to read it in its entirety. The question concerns your comment on the EU approach to interoperability, uh, which uh, the questioner presumes is referring to the DMA proposal. And the question is, did I hear Peter say that the USG has, uh, quote, concerns, unquote, and, and there's an editorial here, that could be deeply troubling and would come as a big surprise to a lot of US industry. For decades, US policy has encouraged interoperability, use of existing standards, et cetera. Moreover, the trend in the US, both in competition and in IP, is to recognize the key role of interoperability and accurate, complete disclosure of information necessary for interoperability, particularly from the dominant players in the market. What is the specific concern the USG is stating to the, EU, to the EU, uh, since many innovative companies are encouraged by the EU and US approach on this question? So let me begin by saying I actually really appreciate the um, the tail end of that uh, question, and I'm glad we got to it because you know it's interesting when you when you sort of look in the um, you know you look at sort of uh, corporate engagement with the DMA and and, and DSA and in Europe sort of what individual companies are doing. I think often you know there are understandable. Um, uh, you know, concerns being expressed by some of the large uh, tech firms that um, feel, uh, you know, and are in, in some ways the primary uh, targets of the DMA and DSA. But you also, I, you know, we've talked to tech firms of all sizes. Uh, and to come back to my point at the beginning, we do think there are legitimate um, regulatory interests and concerns, like not every U.S. firm is opposed to all aspects of the DMA and DSA, as that question uh, I think makes clear, and I think you do see a number of, um, you know, smaller and mid-size uh, firms uh, that have, uh, you know, expressed some support for provisions uh, of the uh, the DMA and DSA. I don't want to speak for them. I'd let any firm speak for itself. I'm just saying, in terms of like the incoming we get, we hear from a wide range of stakeholders as we develop U.S. government uh, views um, on. Uh, on digital um, uh, regulatory issues or on any uh, any other issues. And I, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that we oppose interoperability, you know, per se. I just simply meant to suggest, you know, as we've sort of said, if you're going to require a platform to open itself up to its, uh, to open itself up uh, more than it is today, you know, we would uh, want to ensure that that is done so in a way that protects cybersecurity, that kind of you know, minimizes uh, the, the data and information that has to be provided to only you know, to what is, what is needed to accomplish a legitimate uh, regulatory goal rather than and sort, sort of going, going broad. So I, 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 I hope that answers the question. That's how I interpreted the question. The next one is, could you speak more to the implications of these European digital trade regulations? for disinformation and misinformation, will, will they be likely to make the problem worse or better? Yeah, so look, I think that, that um, you know, some of the, so I think the problem of disinformation, misinformation, it, it is an enormous societal problem. And I think the president has been extremely direct and the administration has been you know, extremely direct in the seriousness with which we see, you know, disinformation, whether it's, you know, lies about COVID vaccine, um, you know, vaccine safety spreading uh, at scale uh, online or, um, you know, other kinds of, uh, of harmful, harmful content. And so I think that we, um, you know, we, we need to be forthright. There is a massive problem of misinformation and disinformation uh, rife across the internet, including on a number of the, um, uh, you know, on a number of, 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 of platforms. You know, this is one reason why, for example, we have committed uh, in the TTC 
to working cooperatively on algorithmic uh, on issues around algorithms, right? You saw that in the um, uh, in the uh, the TTC uh, outcomes because you know reality is you know we here in the U.S. very strong believers in uh, the First Amendment uh, and and uh, you know and free speech uh, protections. Um, on the other hand, when there is an algorithm that is taking something that is an outright falsehood and spreading it to tens of millions of people, that creates a policy problem, right? And so we see some opportunity to work with the Europeans on how do we think through, you know, ways to kind of slow down the spread of misinformation, disinformation uh, online, uh, given the scale and severity of the problem we are facing, not just here in the U.S. and in Europe, but frankly around the world, I think some of the recent, you know, um, uh, disclosures uh, around misinformation and disinformation online have brought home some of the the worst impacts of it are actually in uh, developing uh, world in the developing world where you know there may not be good language expertise on the part of the technology uh, platforms and maybe less resourcing on on. Um, trying to slow the spread of mis and disinformation. This is clearly a global problem we need to be working on, not only uh, with Europe, but also, um, you know, with uh, with partners uh, around the around the world. Okay, the next one is sort of two questions combined. Uh, is tech a special sector? It was not singled out in the EO, but in Europe, the rhetoric often seems to see particular concerns related to the tech sector. And also on the DMA, are you satisfied that there is sufficient opportunity for redress or appeal by companies, both regarding designation as a gatekeeper, but also regarding alleged actions contrary to the prohibitions? So, so you know, I, I appreciate the question. I think, you know, as you saw in the EO, uh, for us, uh, Biden, uh, Harris administration, as we think about competition policy um, writ large, we have not focused only on the tech sector. And so I appreciate the question because, you know, we had agriculture and you know, defense and telecom and, uh, you know, shipping, um, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of sectors that we're, we're, we're working on kind of across the board in, in to you know, ensure we have a competitive uh, competitive uh, economy uh, here, um, here in the, the, the U.S. And so I think from a domestic competition policy perspective, you know, we look at, you uh, it's important to have competition kind of in all sectors, not just in tech. Obviously, some of the issues we're talking about here, like, you know, disinformation, misinformation, um, you know, sort of the tech sector is really the problem there, right? We're not seeing a lot of, you know, disinformation being spread uh, by farm equipment, right? So there are particular, there are particular um, uh, issues that obviously apply to the tech sector that are not uh, to, to, to other sectors. So I think from a competition policy perspective, we certainly see uh, a need for strong competition policy and competition policy enforcement uh, across the uh, across the board. Um, you know, we're obviously here talking about the DMA and DSA, so we've sort of largely been focused on the the tech sector for the purposes of uh, this uh, this discussion. In terms of rights, of the look, I just get to the point I made in some of my opening remarks, and I'm not going to give. I, well, I, what I'd say is sort of as I said at the in my opening remarks, we do think it's important that there is you know, dialogue both between governments, given the complexity of this regulation, also that there is a chance for uh, companies impacted uh, by the regulations to have dialogue uh, with the uh, the regulators. And I think it, it's, it's, it's an, particularly given the novelty and newness of a number of these regulations, I think that, that having a, a strong and effective dialogue mechanism uh, would be quite, uh, quite useful. Um, whether in Europe or here. <clears throat> well, let me, the next one um, gets, goes back to the um, mis disinformation or misinformation uh, uh, issue a little in part. And that is, uh, what do you think about the EU DSA package, quote, know your business customer, unquote, requirements. And the question provides a description of what those requirements are supposed to do, quote, the so-called know your business customer principle will require platforms to check and stop fraudulent companies using their services to sell their illegal and unsafe products and content. Such a measure will help address one part of the problem with disinformation, misleading or illegal content and the sale of unsafe and fake products online. 
Yeah, so I, I actually don't have a specific uh, a specific comment uh, on that uh, right now. I, I just sort of, um, yeah, I, I don't have a specific comment on that that one right now. Sorry. Well, I suspect you won't on the next one either, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And you, ne you never know, you know, sometimes uh, <clears throat> there's a black swan that magically appears. Um, this one is to uh, follow up on your remarks about uh, going through the, uh, the various acts section by section. Um, what are examples of provisions that the U.S. doesn't like and or doesn't agree with? Yeah, no, look, I, you know, I, I think I've been actually, frankly, um, uh, I've certainly tried to be quite open uh, and direct uh, about the uh, kinds of concerns that we have had. Um, I am not today going to kind of walk through, you know, specific articles. I, I doubt your audience has copies of the acts uh, in front. Uh, of them. But what I would say is, you know, we, we, I think I've been quite clear and direct in a number of the concerns, as well as sort of expressing support for legitimate regulatory objectives. Um, you know, what we have done with our, our allies and partners is to go through this in a sort of a provision by provision um, uh, manner, you know, looking not, you know, at, at sort of um, where we think different individual provisions uh, could be, you know, changed to uh, be more effective while minimizing uh, unintended consequences. Another one that uh, I suspect you won't want to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, this goes back way back to the beginning when uh, uh, I mentioned the Reuters report about the EU paper uh, presented to the, uh, I'm sorry, the US paper presented to the EU on the DMA and the DSA. Um, and the question basically is, um, if the concerns articulated in that paper, uh, as well as the ones that you've talked about today, are not heated by the EU, what are you gonna do? Look, I, we are in discussions with the EU. I think we wanna get through these discussions and, and you know, see where they go. Uh, and we are you know, uh, hopeful and optimistic. We will be able uh, to see a number of our, of our uh, concerns um, uh, addressed and we'll have to evaluate our options you know, going forward. Right? Not sort of, you know, we're taking this step by step, identify our concerns, share our concerns, discuss them, uh, also discuss, you know, sort of what we think is fair and legitimate. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll evaluate uh, going forward uh, what we would, you know, what would make sense, um, what would make sense. So here's one that follows up your, your comment about uh, the TTC addressing social media algorithms that spread disinformation. Uh, how will the U.S. and EU get the platforms to share information about their algorithms and what authority will the governments have to persuade the platforms to change them to reduce the disinformation? Yeah, so I think this is a great question. I think what I'd say here is, you know, first we're trying to understand better uh, how the algorithms uh, work and what um, we think, you know, what what is and isn't working, and to understand from outside experts, you know, the various kind of recommendations and solutions that have been uh, put out there. You know, I don't have sort of specific legal mechanisms uh, in mind right now, right? This is something we're working on with the Europeans over the next, well, in advance of the next TTC uh, in, um, uh, in the spring. Uh, and the Europeans have not yet proposed a specific date uh, for it. So, you know, I think we first wanna work through the substance of what we, what we think a policy solution would be, and then work through the legal modalities of how to get there or non-legal modalities in the sense that, you know, maybe they're things you do on a voluntary basis with at least willing uh, companies. Well, I think uh, we're getting to the end here and I'm gonna go back to Meredith if she wants to make a, a closing comment in a minute, but um, I for one wanna thank you, Peter. This is, I think has been uh, uh, a, a lot of, you provide a lot of information and I appreciate your frankness on, on these issues. It's comforting to know that the government is, um, it seems to be really on top of the issues and has spent a lot of time uh, thinking about them and trying to deal with them and has identified some difficulties uh, as we have uh, in, in our work. And I think the, the problems that, that we've discussed in our more recent papers, uh, which are a lot of the ones that Meredith asked you about, uh, seem to be on, on your radar as well, uh, which is encouraging. Um, and so uh, I just wanna thank you for uh, uh, shedding uh, a, a good bit more light on what's going on. Meredith, do you have a... a yeah, I, a, I would just echo that. Thank you very, very much. You've got a multifaceted, very complicated remit here to get done with the Europeans, and uh, we appreciate your candor.
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Well, we had, we had you on frequently when we'll have you back because as you know, one of our other uh, big issues is supply chains and uh, I'll, I'll be sure to send you my column for my next week's column, which is going to address, uh, uh, I think, some of those issues and uh, uh, probably it'll be a bit cranky, but you know, that's my job. But uh, this has been great. Uh, and I think a, a very useful uh, thing for the audience and I, I chuckled when you said that our, our audience probably does not have a copy of the DMA, DMA and DSA in front of them as we're, we're talking. And my reaction was, don't be so sure about that. <laughs> you know, we, we have an audience that, that uh, gets very involved in these things and takes them very seriously, as I think you could tell by the informed questions. But uh, you did a great job of responding to them. And uh, we're very grateful for giving us the, the time that you did today. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you to the audience uh, for sticking with us, and uh, we hope to uh, uh, have you all with us again for another event. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Take care.